Today's show is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in the show. But for now, let's get into today's conversation. I'm joined by Chris Whalen, Chairman of Whalen Global Advisors. Nice to see you, Chris. You are an expert on the banking sector, and I really want to dive deep into what's going on. Are banks making loans? Are they making money? What are the risks? And I'm really curious, Chris, just what has been going, you know, what's your outlook on the banks? And then also what has been going on? Because over the past six months, interest rates have exploded higher, whether you look at the two year or the 10 year, and this is supposed to be good for banks, right? But they're stuck in the mud. What's going on? Well, if you're an investor and you're trying to think about revenue and earnings going forward, you start with 2019 as your baseline. Uh, you really can't use 20 and 21 because there were so many uh, extraordinary items in the mix and you got to separate all those out. So you start with that and you say, okay, how much growth are we going to have in the U.S. economy? Maybe if we're lucky, a couple of percentage points, probably no more than that. So I wouldn't look for a really torrid growth in any of the banks. If anything, their balance sheets will get smaller. Their returns will improve as they shrink. And they really do need to shrink about 10 to 15 percent on average, uh, most banks, to kind of get it back to a size that makes sense economically and financially. The key driver for bank valuations is credit. So when the Fed came in in April 2020 to save the world and basically started buying uh, both Treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities to add liquidity to the system, they pushed up home prices, they pushed up the value of all types of real estate. In fact, the only asset class in the real estate world that didn't perform well was multifamily housing, rentals. And that's because you had a moratorium on people paying their rent for 18 months. If you're a landlord, that hurts. You know, they don't just have cash laying around waiting for COVID. So the banks look great. Uh, they're their revenues were boosted. You had a lot of capital markets activity, but you didn't have any credit expenses. In fact, credit was a negative in, in terms of the bank. They didn't have to put aside money for credit loss. So it made them look better. Now we're going back to normal. And as you see with JP Morgan, credit is now a, an expense again, after basically a year and a half where they were taking money out of reserves to make their earnings look better. So you have two years of big adjustments, big volatility in corporate earnings reporting and the presentation of that earnings. And now I think we're going to normalize kind of around 2019 levels of revenue and earnings, which is not what people expect. You know, the street has a very happy narrative when it comes to stock prices. But when you saw a U.S. bank get to two times book, that told you that we were kind of in a, a very special time. You, uh, JP Morgan got the one and three quarter times book, which is pretty good for them. They're a big mainstream bank. You know, the best performer in the country, by the way, I bet you can't guess who it is, is American Express. The little bank inside American Express had driven that business to six and a half times book value. But even that example doesn't touch some of the crypto banks last year, uh, all of which have come off dramatically, by the way. Chris, can you explain that dynamic of banks uh, setting aside money for credit losses, but sometimes they did it in reverse and they essentially printed money uh, uh, that way? Because I think you know, a lot of people think of a business as they they buy a bag of rocks for a dollar and they sell it as sand for two, but the banking business, it's it's pretty complicated. And a lot of it is, is sort of, uh, con it's, 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 it, can, it, it can look a lot like alchemy. So to describe the alchemy that banks we're doing over the past two years because default rates were so low and why that's stopping? Well, what the Fed did basically was they pushed the cost of funds for the banking industry almost down to nothing. In the third quarter of last year, we hit a record low, which was, you know, 11 basis points on $22 trillion worth of bank assets. It's nothing. It's a rounding error. So by pushing the cost of money down to zero for the banks, they were able to preserve what we call net interest margin. In other words, what the banks make on loans, less what they pay for money, deposits, bonds, everything. You put all those numbers together and it tells you what their cost of funds was. The banks have tried to maintain profitability and earnings with a huge amount of volatility. The Fed adds all this cash to the market, they grow in size, but at the same time, the money they were making on their loans was falling too. So by the time we got to last year, the Fed almost had to stop 
quantitative easing because they would have destroyed the banks. If you had pushed the earning assets down much further, you really would have noticed. And that would have disturbed the narrative on Wall Street, which says everything is fine. OK, so now what I tell people is that we're reverting back to the mean. Banks are going to struggle to get better prices for their loans. The average you know, gross yield before you subtract funding costs and administrative costs for a big bank is inside of 4% today. 4% is not much. So you pay 25 basis points for the cost of funds. You pay about a point and a half for selling costs and administrative expenses. That's what's left. And so, you know, for a lot of banks, I think, you know, it's great to have cheap money, but they have struggled to try and make loans that make sense. So for example, during COVID, when people got a lot of help from the government and they were obviously not paying their rent or paying their, their uh, mortgage payments, they paid off their credit cards. Credit cards for U.S. banks fell by almost 20%, the outstanding balances, right? That's bad. That's how banks make money. So when people weren't using credit during the past couple of years, it actually made it tougher for the banks and they had to lean on the capital market side, investment banking, the ones who were lucky have a big wealth management business, which is pretty steady. Uh, but the banking side of the business has been tough because it's been very competitive to find good loans that actually make sense, make money. And why are loan yields still pretty low? I'm just looking at, so we're recording on Thursday, April 14th. Uh, a lot of banks just reported their earnings. I'm looking at Citibank's yeah. quarterly report and the gross Whoa. loan yield of, uh, let's see, uh, 2021 first quarter 5.44 percent. The go gross right. loan yield now is 5.46 percent a year later. Yeah. So two basis points. So how come with all these rate hikes and all this tightness priced into the market on a relative basis, how come loan yields are still so low? Well, you just made an interesting point about City. City's different from the other top four banks. So, you know, think about the top five. You include U.S. Bank Corp. So U.S. Bank, Bank of America, are pretty domestic lenders. They have some capital markets activity. Bank of America has Merrill Lynch, right? Big wealth manager. Citi and JP Morgan have much more of a capital markets business. And then Citi, interestingly enough, has a credit card business that's kind of subprime. It's not like the other banks. They take a lot more risk. They're a lot closer to Capital One if you wanted to compare the businesses. That's really the good comp for Citi when you talk about consumer finance. So Citi is able to make more money than the other banks because the, the rate they charge on credit cards is high teens, low 20s, sometimes higher. So that has always helped Citi. The rest of the business at Citi is frankly mediocre. The capital market side, they don't have a big domestic deposit base. In fact, less than half of Citi's deposits are domestic. It's scattered all over the world. So it's a tough business in, or, in terms of credit, they obviously have higher losses on that subprime credit card book than say JP or Bank America, which are quite pedestrian. Um, so, you know, when Citi shows you that higher yield, that's great, but they have a higher cost of funds. And in times of recession, which is I think where we're headed now, the credit costs will go up faster. And that's just people defaulting on their loans, which they haven't been doing. Correct. So, you know, Citi doesn't have a wealth management business. They don't have the mortgage business. They got out a couple of years ago. They sold the whole book. So there's not much left. It's a two-legged stool. And if you compare them with, say, Morgan Stanley, which has now got a decent-sized bank, it's about a half trillion dollars in deposits, and then they have a nice investment and wealth management business. So three legs of the stool. Gorman has done a very good job uh, steering Morgan Stanley. But you'll notice that this quarter, the numbers are off compared with a year ago. And that's because we're coming out of a period of extraordinary Fed activity. And now we've got to go into a more normal and frankly, more boring uh, environment where banks are still going to have to compete. You asked a question that's very important, which is why can't they get their yield on their loan book up? Well, for the top banks, it's hard because they're looking for big loans and there's intense competition for those assets. As banks get smaller, they have more pricing power. If you look at the bottom of Peer Group One, which is the biggest 130 banks in the country, basically everybody above 10 billion in total assets, the bottom half of that distribution have a gross yield that's a point and a half or two points higher than JP Morgan. Okay, that's what the little banks, they have to fight for deposits, but they have much more pricing power on their loans.
Chris, over the past two years, deposits in JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, the U.S. banking system exploded higher. Yeah. How much of that has to do with quantitative easing? What were the effects of it? And now that quantitative tightening is forthcoming, you know, are we going to see that in reverse? Yes. Um, the mechanics of this are fascinating uh, and also, I think, indicate just how reckless and speculative monetary policy has been in the U.S. When the Fed bought a bond, what they did was they called up Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan and they said, hey, I want to buy a bond. So Morgan sells them the bond, the Fed pays them, and that creates a reserve account at the Fed. The guys at J.P. Morgan like reserves at the Fed because there's no market risk. It doesn't go up and down. It's the same dollar every day. When the Fed reverses this process and they're no longer buying securities, what happens is the, the Treasury pays the Fed when the security redeems, but the Fed doesn't buy a new bond. Now, Treasury is running a deficit. They have to go out and refinance that bond. So they sell that bond to an investor. The bank deposit that was created and the reserve that was created disappear. So as the Fed stops reinvesting the flow of prepayments on the mortgage bonds, the redemptions on the treasury bonds, the balance sheet of the banks is going to fall. But interestingly, it's not dollar for dollar, it's two dollars for every dollar. So a dollar is the Fed, you know, the banks lose a, a deposit. It, it gets, uh, it disappears because the investor bought the treasury bond. Instead of having the Fed buy the bond, the customer bought the bond. But the other part of this, Jack, that's very significant is that the Fed is no longer a buyer of these securities. So the street, the big primary dealers have to come up and put capital to work to buy bonds and sell those bonds to investors. And this is going to have a big impact on the housing market. I think you're going to see 6% mortgages in this country by the end of June, which may sound extraordinary, but it's going to happen. Uh, and then the Treasury market, too, has to look for buyers because the Fed is not standing there basically monetizing half of the federal deficit every year. That's a big issue for policymakers in Washington. And you know what? They don't want to talk about it. The last thing Joe Biden wants to talk about right now is inflation or the Fed or housing prices, because none of it is good. Uh, yeah, cr Chris, how integral to inflation is the commercial banking sector. No, they, that was not part of the, the process this time. And that's a very important question you asked, Jack, because in, traditionally, the banks were transmission belts for monetary policy. So if the Fed dropped interest rates, the banks were supposed to make lots of loans, you got consumption, demand pull inflation, and all of a sudden prices were galloping. That's the way things were 30, 40 years ago, when we were a lot younger, you were probably still in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you have a situation where the inflation is coming because of the surfeit of liquidity out there, not necessarily from banks, though. You have inflation in terms of people having the cash to just go out and buy a home. Uh, the house across the street from me just went for 30 percent more than I paid for the house I'm sitting in today uh, that I bought a year ago. OK. That shows you that there's demand for housing out there that has nothing to do with interest rates. A lot of these are cash transactions. People are just buying the house. So there's an awful lot of cash in the hands of consumers and business. And I would love to be able to tell you that the banks had a part in it, but they didn't because commercial lending was actually pretty weak during 2020, 21. It started to turn up a bit at the end of last year, like credit cards. Credit cards started to go back up again third quarter last year. But before that, they were falling. People were paying off debt. So, you know, your question is, how did we get this inflation if, if bank balances, loan balances were going down? And the answer is, is that this society, I think, had a lot of pent up demand for housing, first off. And then when you drive interest rates down, so people were getting two and a half percent mortgages, obviously they went out and bought a house. But you had a lot of speculative activity, too. You had institutional investors buying homes as investments. You had a big bid for a lot of commercial properties that are outside of urban areas. But the trouble is multifamily housing in big cities is in trouble. Uh, banks hold those loans and the landlords are in a lot of trouble because the politicians never thought about taking care of the landlord. They were too busy taking care of the consumers. You know, they never even thought about it. 
I, I doubt most members of Congress could even discuss this with you, Jack. So, you know, that's kind of where we are. We are we are in the age of the dilettante and the people who are supposed to be taking care of us in Washington don't have a clue. I, I think the most of the members of the Federal Reserve Board ought to resign based on their performance on inflation. You know, we have to have accountability again in the system if we're going to get things like inflation and economic growth under some kind of control. Chris, I'm going to ask you a little bit of a tough question. Let's wind the clock back a year. It's April 14th, 2021. Chris Whalen is the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. What do you do to to tame in policy? Are you, are you hiking rates early or are you stopping quantitative easing? What, what are you doing? I'm, I'm with Jim Bullard, who's been very critical of the Federal Open Market Committee. I think they should have tapered purchases of securities earlier. This policy was largely speculative. Uh, the Fed didn't know what to do. They, the traditional mechanism of dropping the target on Fed funds and then getting more bank lending didn't work. So going back to 2009, 2010, they went back to buying securities because they thought this was stimulus and the media accepts this explanation without any questions. It is striking to me how little critical comment and analysis we get out of the, the media, except for you, of course, Jack. Um, but I would have slowed things down. And even today, I would have I would focus on reducing the size of the balance sheet. I wouldn't be terribly concerned about the target for Fed funds. You know, you don't have a lot of pull right now in terms of demand for credit, trying to pull that interest rate up. So they got to be careful because if you get Fed funds up to two, two and a half percent uh, by the end of this year, early next year, that may be as far as you can go without causing a liquidity crisis in the system. And again, I think the Fed has to be very careful telling people in Washington that they can manage this process when I don't think they can. I work in the world for secured finance. Uh, the firm I work with in New York uh, runs to be announced uh, transactions for mortgage lenders. This is how people hedge interest rates, by the way. It's the second largest market in the world after treasuries. And we do a lot of other investment banking and financing activities. So this is where I live every day. And if the Fed gets this wrong again, Jack, we're going to have a problem. You know, we really do. This system is very fragile and it is not set up for quick, rapid changes in rates. I mean, look at the past month. We have had volatility in all of these markets. We have the 10 year Treasury bond moving 10, 15 percent in terms of yield in a day. How do you hedge a business? How do you hedge a mortgage company? Uh, if you have to deal with this kind of change every day. So unfortunately, quantitative easing may have bought us some time with COVID and credit problems related to COVID, but it also gave us enormous volatility in the markets. And that's what people are dealing with today. I want to zoom in on a pretty specific issue you and I were discussing earlier, which is, as you said, you're an expert in the mortgage-backed security market. And the Federal Reserve bought a ton of mortgage-backed securities uh, over the past two years. They might, uh, the official policy is we're going to let the balance sheet roll off. We're not going to sell treasuries. We're not going to sell mortgage backed securities. We're just going to let them expire and the treasury will have to refinance. However, mortgage backed securities have a little bit of a idiosyncratic quality to them. That means that they might not roll off uh, be because of interest rates and convexity. So I want you to explain that and also explain that if they, the Federal Reserve were forced to sell mortgage-backed securities, do people want to still buy these you know, mortgage-backed securities with coupons at 1%? No, no, they don't. Um, the quick tutorial on mortgage-backed securities. If you go back 30, 40 years on Wall Street, many of the financial crises, going back to Kidder Peabody, long-term capital management, all of the rest of these events, came about because investors bought a piece of paper in one interest rate environment and the piece of paper, you know, was supposed to have an average life of three or four years. This is very similar to what you saw with the Fed when the Fed pushed interest rates down a year and a half, two years ago. Almost everybody in the mortgage market was selling those new mortgages they were giving people like me. I did a three percent jumbo a year ago into uh, good trade. Good trade, Chris. Yeah, I, I think so. But they were selling that into a Fannie Mae 2% mortgage-backed security. Well, today, if I were to do that mortgage, it would be a four and a half, maybe a four and three quarter, 
and it would go into a Fannie Mae five and a half security. Okay, that's a big change in a year. So now that Fannie Mae two and a half, and there are twos, and there's even a few one and a half percent mortgage backed securities out there are trading in the low 90s and the high 80s. The on the run paper, what you know, people are selling mortgages into today are so far away from those securities in terms of the coupon that nobody's making a market in the old paper. So when the Fed says, well, we may have to sell some bonds next year, and you see an enormous commentary among the analyst community about this, my question is, who are you going to sell it to? Uh, there is no bid out there for Ginny May 2s, uh, not a bid that you would want to hit. If the Fed goes ahead and tries to sell this paper into an illiquid market, they're going to take enormous losses, 10, maybe 12 point loss on the security. When that happens, guess what? The Fed can't make remittances to the Treasury anymore. They have to wait until they earn their way out of that hole before they could start sending money to the Treasury again. The politicians will notice that. So Jay Powell has a big political problem. But more importantly, I don't think they can sell the bonds to your question. I don't think there's a bid out there for the kind of size we're talking about. So since that paper is not going to prepay, in other words, people at a Ginny May 2 are not going to refinance their mortgage. They're 200 basis points out of the money now. They're going to keep that bond forever. The Fed could end up having to keep these securities for 12, 15 years. Chris, isn't the you know the Federal Reserve one of the only financial institutions on earth that can swallow a loss like that? If it was a private bank, I would be very worried. But can't the Federal Reserve print money or print bank reserves from nothing? Why should we be worried about the Federal Reserve losing money? No. Well, number one, because our beloved public servants in Congress confiscated all their capital and they set a cap on the Fed's capital at $40 billion. It's nothing. So it is true that central banks can be indifferent to loss in an economic sense, but they cannot be indifferent to the optics of being insolvent. Okay, people can read a balance sheet and an income statement. So even though, yes, they can monetize the cost and basically, you know, get rid of it over time, they have that capacity, it doesn't look good. So right. the arrangement they came up with is when the Fed takes a loss, they don't subtract the number directly from capital. They have a little contra account off to the side. It's much like the way banks set aside reserves for future losses. So the Fed will have to earn their way out of those losses before they're allowed to remit any profits to Congress and to the Treasury. That is going to be a big political problem for the central bank. OK, Chris, so you're saying the Federal Reserve's balance sheet is at nine trillion, maybe just shy of nine trillion, nine trillion of dollars of securities. But it also has nine trillion of liabilities that are bank reserves that are the assets of commercial banks. So net net, once you cancel it, the cap, the, the maximum capital could have is $40 billion. That makes sense. It's a bad optics to have the Fed trading and solve it. And that's where we're headed. Because if they decide to try and sell any of this stuff, they have a big problem. What I suggested, by the way, Jack, is that they should just pick up the phone and call the Bank of Japan and see if the Bank of Japan will exchange some of these gnarly mortgage-backed securities they own uh, for treasury paper. Because the, the super national buyers like Bank of China, Bank of Japan, they like mortgage-backed securities. They don't like prepayments. You know, think about it. If you pay 104 for a Ginny Mae 2 a year ago and you start getting prepayments at par, that hurts. You're losing four points every time you get a prepayment. And prepayments happen when when, when mortgage rates decline work. because everyone wants to refinance. Yeah. But when mortgage rates rise, shouldn't that uh, preclude prepayments? So shouldn't that actually? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's going to drop to nothing. But that's my point. They, oh, it's, yeah. That's... So no one's going to refinance. So therefore, nope. the three year paper that the Federal Reserve thought they owned is actually expires in ten years. That's Maybe 15. that's crazy, Chris. Well, it's called extension risk. It's traditionally been one of the biggest risks that financial institutions face in terms of selecting assets for their balance sheet. In this case, the Fed has taken the risk and they didn't understand it at the time. They understand it now um, because I, I think from a policy perspective, their hands are tied. I cannot imagine that they're going to try and stuff those 
low coupon securities down the throat of the dealer community just to hit their targets. So when it comes to mortgage-backed securities, the Fed is kind of screwed. What about commercial banks? I noticed today that Wells Fargo, they had a 33% year-over-year decrease in their mortgage lending. Yep. Has that been a profitable business since the great financial crisis? Has it been profitable over the two years when there have been no defaults? And what is your outlook on it going forward? Well, almost everybody made money in mortgages over the past couple of years, except for Brian Moynihan at Bank of America, of course, who managed to have a down year in 2020 when everybody else was experiencing record volumes. I don't, I don't know how you do that. Um, there are some embedded losses on the books of banks because they kept some of those loans that were made during 2020, 2021. So those, those loans are underwater. And the mortgage-backed securities that banks buy for liquidity for their treasury, again, those securities are deep underwater. They're trading at 90 or below. So I think what you're going to see is smaller banks are going to have some pain. They're, they're going to have what we call other comprehensive income, where they're going to take a loss on their, on their uh, assets available for sale because they have to mark them every quarter. They have to do a mark to market. And even if they don't sell it, they're going to show the loss. But as time goes by, the loss is going to get bigger. So I think banks are going to have a tough time. Let's imagine the Fed gets Fed funds up to 3%. Guess what? Those mortgage-backed securities are going to be underwater. It's going to be like the 1980s with SNLs when interest rates went up really quick and they couldn't reprice their loans. It's the same problem. So I, I would be really watching for this over the next couple quarters. There are banks, insurance companies, credit unions. The smaller guys don't have the sophistication and the resources to hedge interest rate risk. And a lot of people kind of went to sleep over the last couple of years. They said, well, rates are going to be low forever. We don't have to hedge. Well, yeah, you did have to hedge. <laughs> but imagine some kid who's trying to, to manage the interest rate risk of a mortgage lender today, the way markets are moving around every day. What do you do? And the answer is they're no longer providing 30-day rate locks for consumers. They'll tell you what the rate is when you close the loan. So that's a big change from two years ago where everybody was saying, oh, you're fine. Here's the rate lock for the next 45 days, okay? Because there was no upside risk. Rates were going down, right? That's changed. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto-friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash jack. Thank you. And let's get back to the show. You turn you turn on the TV on, they say, oh, rate, rates are rising. That's good for banks. Is that true or no? No, it, that's what they have taught uh, buy side managers to say when they appear on CNBC. The point about profitability in banks is to spread between the cost of funds of the bank and what they make on the loans. Net interest margin. Uh, net interest margin was protected by the Fed when they push rates down. I'm not sure they can protect the banks as we normalize rates. So if you start seeing funding costs rising faster than what the banks make on their loans, then they're going to get squeezed. And how do banks secure funds. Let's let's get into the plumbing a little bit. I know if, if I'm JP Morgan and you're the Fed and you do QE, you buy a treasury security from me, I have bank reserves. I can't loan bank reserves to customers because customers don't have a deposit d deposit with the Fed. Yes, you How can. do I go about yeah, the, I can? Your, the reserves are cash. They're part of your overall liquidity. The trouble with reserves, the the kind we've discussed before that were created during quantitative easing, is they don't they don't last very long. They, they usually have a, you know, a average life of less than a year. So you're not going to use that to make a 30 year mortgage. What you, you need for a bank to grow your book is what we call core deposits. That's mom and dad's checking account. That's corporate deposits were the most important part. 
So if you're a bank and you're trying to grow your business, you got to get businesses, small and mid-sized enterprises, to give you your their payroll. You get to sit on that. You want to have mortgage loans on your book because you give them your payroll. You mean? You mean? Yeah, they give you the cash, and you get to sit on it for a week before you send the payments out. Hmm. Uh, if you get a prepayment on a mortgage, let's say somebody refinances their mortgage, the principal repayment goes through the bank. It sits there for two weeks, interest free. So those are the kinds of funds that banks can use to build their business. The stuff from the Fed is very transitory. There's that word transitory, right? Um, and they're not enduring. Okay. And I remember walking down the street during the morning, seeing going by a bank window in 2018, 2019, and seeing rates higher than zero at deposit rates. And I was like, what is it? Am I on Mars? Uh, so you're saying when the Fed funds rates goes up, the, the the funding rate will go up as well in order to attract deposits. Very slowly. Yeah, bank deposit rates go up slowly because right now banks are awash in cash. Uh, if Jamie Dimon could make his bank 20% smaller tomorrow morning, he would do it. He, he, and they have been, you know, a lot of the big banks like Wells have been pushing big deposits out of the bank. They've been literally saying, here, Jack, take your money and put it somewhere else because they don't Why? want it. They don't want it. it. It it kills their equity returns because again, they can't use that money for much. They can invest it in T bills. That's about it. So, you know, for banks, a lot of them would love to be smaller. And I think you'll see the industry's total size go down about 10% over the next couple of years. So, you know, that's another part of managing this process. When banks are shrinking, that means liquidity is shrinking. And the Fed has to figure out how they're going to somehow prevent another market crisis. But at the same time, they want the banks to, to shrink. Why are why is a recession in your uh, in, in your in your mirror when you when you look forward? Why are you forecasting recession? Well, I think the Fed managed to provide some stimulus for a lot of different areas of the economy, especially housing. But you also have the lingering effects of COVID. And then we have the problems caused by the war in Ukraine, which are going to be profound. You're going to have elevated commodity prices. You're going to have disruption in many parts of the global economy. You're going to have famines in certain parts of Africa and, and Asia because they buy grain from Russia and Ukraine. It's not there. Um, so I think that we're going to be dealing with the disruptions, the lingering problems from COVID. Look at China. China is not done with COVID. That's going to be a big negative for the global economy. And I think, you know, as I say, last couple of years, the U.S. economy was on steroids and happy juice. Now, as we normalize, you're going to find out just how solid the U.S. economy is. And that's why I'm, I'm thinking the Fed is never going to get to that 3% Fed funds target. Uh, if they get a couple of half point increases between now and the fall, they should count themselves lucky. Because you raise rates too quickly, this thing's going to vapor lock, Jack. It's just going to stop. And uh, How? Thing... Expl explain to me the plumbing. You said that deposit rates rising is going to be a slow process. JP Morgan already has too much money. So if it's not the cost of funds, how, how, is, how is high rates going to derail well, it, the economy? It's the cost of funds for everybody else outside the banking system. Uh, the sticker shock for emerging companies in the high yield market, for example, is going to be considerable. Uh, when you can no longer finance new businesses, you, you know what I'm talking about. There were a lot of companies that emerged over the past 24 months that really would not have worked in a normal interest rate environment, but somehow they were able to go public. I mean, look at all the mortgage companies that went public. That's not a normal activity. Mortgage companies typically trade below book value because of the risk, because they are highly correlated to interest rates. So when you saw a bunch of them going public, you know, middle to end of last year, that was bad. That told you that bad things were happening. Um, when you saw the big banks, like uh, particularly Capital One, which rarely trades above book, well above book value. When you saw Goldman Sachs trade at one and a half times book, that's not normal because these are high risk businesses. Investors typically wanna get them at a discount. So as we normalize all of this, and we start to force institutions, especially non-bank institutions, which raise their money in the markets, pay real rates for the cost of capital, 
that's going to slow things down a lot. I think you could see stocks give up quite a bit of ground this year, maybe 10, 20 percent. Chris, so you're not constructive on U.S. stock, let's say the S&P 500. Are you, how do you feel about bank stocks uh, relative to the S&P 500? Are you bearish on the bank stocks, but more bullish than you are on the S&P or more bearish than you are? I'm as an investor, I'm bullish because I'm going to get an opportunity to buy some stocks, both commons and preferreds at reasonable valuations. Because in April 20, I got rid of all my common stocks and I loaded up on bank preferreds. The, my favorite time, Jack, is when there's blood in the streets, because that means I could go out and buy boring uh, stuff that helps me balance my barbell approach. I have some very high beta stocks like NVIDIA and some of the oil companies. And then I have boring stuff like bank preferreds, which never move. But during the last couple of years, these things were trading at a 10, 15, 20% premium in some cases. So I'm looking forward to market weakness so I can load up on that. But you know what? People like American Express or Schwab are not going anywhere. These are solid businesses. They're making money. Uh, there are other banks like that in that category. My, my best pick last year was Western Alliance. That bank doubled in, in terms of the stock. Why? Because they bought one of the best mortgage companies in the US, Amerihome, which was an Apollo portfolio company. So there are there's a lot of value in the banking market, but remember, buy side managers buy big. They don't care if the, the stock is mediocre. They don't care if the financial performance is so-so like Bank America, they buy it for liquidity. If they were buying quality, they wouldn't even look at the top four. They would start at US Bank and work their way down because it's in the middle of the big bank group that you have the highest equity returns. And you also have growth, they buy other banks. So for me, if I wanna be long financials, I'll start nibbling away at the commons when they get back towards book value. And then I'm going to look to buy some of the better performers cheap, because to me, that's where you want to be. If you really like the growth in financials, and I do, you don't buy JP Morgan. JP is your bellwether. Uh, you wait until some of the others get a little bit cheaper, and then you go in and, and you feast. So I'm thinking about uh, adding to my portfolio in terms of the bank names, the quality names. But I'm also expecting to see the Capital Ones and the Goldman Sachs trade back down to where they're supposed to be. They don't deserve to be at a premium to book. And I think you have to be disciplined as an investor. You have to know what you want and you got to watch it carefully. Um, this market, if we get a downdraft, let's say the FOMC goes for a half point next, uh, next month. And all of a sudden you start to get volatility in the credit markets, even more than we're seeing today. That's going to provide a buying opportunity for equity investors who can keep their nerve and not you know, run away. The tendency in the market is to always be late. People don't start buying until they see everybody buying because it's the shiny object, right? They're all chasing the shiny object. When stuff gets dicey and you start to see people running away from the market, that's when you want to be buying. Uh, but unfortunately, human nature is not to do that. But as humans, we like to eat. We like to avoid danger. Those are the two hardwired tendencies tendencies in human beings. So we're almost always late to the party in terms of stocks. There are very few investors who have the discipline to wait until there's blood in the street and then they buy. So, And, and help me understand, how do you square your cautiously, very cautiously optimistic view on the banks with your expectation that a recession sometime in the near future is, is, is going to come? I, f I feel like typically when a recession is going to come, that's not a time to buy a bank stock, right? Um, it depends how you view credit. I don't expect an apocalyptic uh, cycle here with credit costs going, you know, up to 2008 levels. Yet, let's remember that in the first quarter of 2020, U.S. banks put about $55 billion aside to take care of losses from COVID. Didn't happen. The system kept on going, largely because the Fed had lowered interest rates so much. So they, you know, basically got through that. They went through a couple of tough years when it was hard to make loans that made sense. It was hard to find good assets. Most of them ended up buying bonds instead of making loans. So today, I think you're going to have an environment where banks are going to be able to lend more and, and kind of go back to a more normal business model. 
But is it going to be a great boom? No. You're going to see high credit costs. You're going to see delinquency and loans and, and mortgage securities and all the rest of it. But that's an opportunity for a lot of these guys, too. They make money on that. So I guess what I'm saying is there's not going to be a big boom and there's not going to be a big bust. There's going to be a lot of confusion in the markets. And what you want to do is take advantage of that confusion, have your strategy very firmly in mind as to what you want to own and what you don't want to own. I'll give you a great example. When Nvidia traded off a third from the highs, I was a buyer. And if it trades off more, I'll, you know, as uh, all the chicken littles are running around on television going about, you know, the sky is falling. I love that. I love that. I, I, I want to see, you know, managers in tears on the, on the big uh, news channels and then I'll be buying, you know, back up the truck. Chris, while we're talking about so much panic in the market and blood on the streets. There's immense amount of blood on the streets in treasuries, the 10 year treasury, the 30 year treasury mm-hmm. with drawdowns in, the, in something like TLT, you know, close to 25, 30%. That's right. Is that just is like the time mortgage to- funds we were talking about? The same problem, same problem. See, the Fed created a lot of coupons in treasuries at very low rates. What do you do with those now? Who wants those bonds? They're off the run. If the- well, the, that's right. The Fed owns a lot of that production, by the way. Uh, the Fed owns two thirds of low coupon treasuries and, and mortgages that were issued during that period. So, you know, they're going to have to keep them. That's what it comes down to. And for investors, you know, you have a piece of paper where you have a significant loss and either you sit with it, you keep it, or you can take the loss and try and buy a higher coupon asset. But there's a trade-off there that you have to assess very carefully. What about right right now, your, your outlook on the longer-term treasuries, given that there's been so much pain? Well, it's, it's funny. As the 10-year gets toward 3%, I kind of wonder about that because there are an awful lot of buyers around the world who would like to own a 3% treasury bond. And when you look at the treasury yield curve versus, say, swaps, the swaps are way, way, way lower. And that indicates there's a lot of bid out there for dollars. So I think that, unfortunately, the Fed's mandate and the discussion we have in the U.S. is largely a domestic discussion. We really don't talk about global demand for dollars, but it's a very important factor. And it's not one that a lot of people spend time on. So, you know, my sense is that we could get Treasury yields to get up to, say, three, three and a quarter on the 10 year. But then it may rally. Imagine what happens, Jack, if the Fed is trying to push Fed funds up to 3% and the 10-year Treasury rallies back under 2 which I think could happen. You, you could have a tremendous rally in Treasury bonds. If people see recession, what are they going to buy? They're going to buy safety. You know, if you're a Bank of China and you've been letting your Treasuries run off, but now they're at 3%, you might go buy them before the, the rally starts. Same with the Bank of Japan. Uh, Nuren Chukin, the big postal bank in Japan, is a huge buyer of treasuries and Ginny Mays. So we always have to remember that liquidity is about the availability of cash, but it's also about collateral. And right now, you could argue that there's still a shortage of risk-free collateral in the market today because the treasury deficits are falling. The, you know, the, even though the Fed has slowed the buying of treasury securities, the treasury is issuing fewer securities. And by the way, keep in mind, mortgage market volumes are cut in half. They're, they're going to be probably down 60% this year. Uh, so there's a lot fewer Ginny Mays out there. And as the reserve position of the Fed falls, guess what? Banks have to buy treasuries and Ginny Mays for reserves. So there's a structural change, too, that's going on here that we have to be very cognizant of. Chris, where in the financial world are you seeing the biggest amount of imprudent risk taking you talked a lot about what you like but what do you think are the biggest risks out there we talked a lot about interest rate risk maybe you can elaborate on that more but also credit risk is it clos is it is it high yield bonds or or is it stocks of companies that that deal in these issues what are you the least constructive on i think the new crop of non-bank lenders uh you know people like upstart which i've written about uh, some of these other shops which have embraced automated underwriting for loans. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between artificial intelligence and real intelligence. Uh, 
Uh, and unfortunately, when you get into a market where you're originating consumer loans, unsecured consumer loans, and you're selling that paper to investors and banks, you can almost bet, in fact, I would bet, that there's going to be a lot of delinquency in that paper going forward. Because remember, during the last two years, the Fed made credit risk disappear temporarily. And so all of these models look great, Lending Club, all the rest of them, right? But if you look at the actual pricing of these models and how they make money and the effective rates that they give to consumers in terms of credit, you have to wonder how some of this paper is going to look after a recession. We really haven't tested these models through a serious recession. And I think that's kind of the next thing. So if I'm looking for financial exposure, I would rather be in quality banks than in quality non-banks. Non-banks look great when rates are low and people are making a lot of loans. But when rates go up and volumes fall, they tend to have to make inferior loans to support their volume targets. And that's where they get into trouble. Financial non-banks, lenders that aren't, do not have an account with the Federal Reserve. That's right. And they typically finance themselves either in the equity markets, if they're lucky, or with the lines from a bank. I mean, I'll give you another great example. It's a company called Blend, which provides services in the mortgage space, very high profile IPO. Uh, I think that company is going to have to get bought. I'm not sure they're going to survive. Uh, there's another one called Better uh, Mortgage that was supposed to merge into a SPAC. I don't think that deal is going to get done. And the reason is, is that volumes are falling. Everybody in the industry is focused on cost management, laying people off. So housing was a big tailwind when the Fed was dropping rates during COVID and everything else, but now it's a headwind. We're probably gonna lay off 30, 40% in the mortgage industry this year. Think about that. That's a huge reduction in headcount. What was it in 2007, Chris? Uh, we got cut in half after the crisis. Yeah. And, you know, it was partly the banks were just hunkered down for seven years. So nine, you know, it's very interesting if you compare the 2010 through 20 with the 1990s period. OK, in both cases, you had flat growth in terms of total credit available for housing and very anemic volumes. Then finally, you had pent up demand after eight, 10 years of very weak growth. You have all these millennials who want to have families. You had a lot of other reasons for demand. You had people in cities going out and buying second homes so they could go hide from COVID. So there's a lot of dynamics in this market that are unusual. And now as we transition to hopefully uh, somewhat of a more normal period, you're going to see these markets behave in a, I think, in a more traditional fashion than they have over the past couple of years. Because, you know, banks, it was hard to, you couldn't lose money on a loan. Think about auto loans because of the shortage of cars. The loss given default on auto loans went down almost zero, which is crazy. Because the price of a car went up 50%. Yeah, well, if they defaulted on the auto loan, you rip their garage door off, take the car and sell it the next day. Yeah, if you're not making your car payment, don't put it in the garage and close the door. That's bad because the repossession guy has the right to take your garage door off. Jeez, I didn't. Well, hopefully someone will learn from that while watching pull this. Right off. Boom. Friend of mine. <laughs> I am seeing, you know, a small glimmer of hope in the credit card business where, you know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, their lines of credit to consumers have been going up on a year over year basis. Yep. Does that give you a sense of assurance that you know demand for, for credit is, is going up? Is it a reflection of people having less money because uh, uh, the fiscal support is, is, uh, is no longer there? No, I think that's right. You had a period where people were paying off credit card balances in the kind of 2020. And then in 21, the numbers bottomed a little over 700 billion for bank credit cards. And now we're getting back up towards a trillion dollars in total receivables. What that shows you is that consumers are spending money and they also uh, no longer have cash from not paying their mortgage or not paying their rent that they could use to reduce debt. And now we're kind of normalizing the household's needs in terms of funding costs. So, you know, it's good for banks. The credit cards are probably the single best asset class for commercial banks when it comes to making money. 
Because let's, you know, think about it. Uh, imagine your city, and even though you pay more money for uh, deposits than some of the other big banks, you make three times as much on your credit book compared to Jamie Dimon. Jamie's, you know, the default rate on Jamie Dimon's credit card book is very low. The default rate on Citi's credit card book is two and a half to three times JP. That's because they're willing to bank a lower quality, more subprime customer, and they charge them accordingly. You know, as I like to always explain to policymakers who are angry about payday lenders, why do payday lenders charge 200% interest? Because half of their book is going to default. Those people are not going to pay them back. So the survivors basically subsidize the delinquency. You know, if you, yeah. if you think about it that way, it makes sense. So for banks, they always want to keep their delinquency rate under control, uh, single digits, and then they make money on credit cards. I remember in 2009 when Capital One hit 11% gross defaults on their credit card book, okay? That's a lot. Most, most U.S. banks couldn't tolerate a loss rate half of that. They'd fail. But Capital One, that's their business. They have more capital. They have 13 14% capital, and they know how to manage delinquency. But that's a very different business. That's almost a consumer finance business as opposed to a traditional uh, banking business. Chris, I want to close by asking you about threats that banks face from uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, mm. uh, both in terms of the volatility of, of, of commodity prices, perhaps interfering with hedging uh, via extension of credit to, to commodity traders, as well as uh, credit lines that are, are within Russia that may uh, have to go bad. Today, uh, again, f uh, April 14th, Citibank uh, announced that its current exposure, direct and indirect, was $7.8 billion. Citibank headquartered within the US, but it does business worldwide. Uh, what is the exposure of US banks, Citibank, as well as European bank banks and other foreign banks to Russia? How, and how serious of an issue is it? Most U.S. banks don't have significant offshore operations. Uh, J.P. Morgan, Citi, among the top five, are really the ones you have to be concerned about. And the risk they have is kind of secondary and tertiary. In other words, you know what their direct exposures are, but you don't know what's happening to their customers. So they may have a customer that initially they didn't think had exposure to Russia, but then the customer ends up defaulting. Okay, and the bank doesn't see it initially, but then they have to go deal with it. European banks have the most exposure to Russia, obviously. Uh, you also have some Asian banks. The commodities market is already causing problems. There's been a number of stories about Chinese and uh, European uh, firms that took positions in commodities and were not adequately hedged. It may not be possible to hedge it. So the thing I worry about with Russia is what we don't know. That's why Citi is trading at half a book value right now, because people just don't know what the exposure is. And frankly, the folks at Citi may not know either. They may know what their direct exposures are to Russian companies and the government and all that, but they don't know how that event is impacting their clients. So you could see broad uh, losses slowly bubbling up to the surface all over the global map that may have ties to another bank in the US or another bank in Europe, but we don't see it initially. You know, banks, I think we're hoping that this unfortunate conflict in Ukraine was gonna end relatively quickly, but I don't think that's the case. And, you know, we've cut off a major commodity producer uh, from the global market. We just took out the cleaver and, you know, cut all of those ties. So it's going to take time uh, in industries like shipping, for example, aircraft leasing. You know, here's a, an asset class that was completely gold insured. You know, the planes were probably the most portable and attractive asset in the uh, global capital markets. Now, all of a sudden, uh, the lessors for those aircrafts are going to take total losses. Those planes are not coming back. So, you know, there's a lot of change here that people have to manage, and it takes time. They have to gather the information, figure out what the losses are, and then deal with it. And I think we'll be hearing more from City. Any European banks in particular that you're looking 
add that you think are particularly vulnerable, you know, Deutsche Bank, Alliance, or are they all sort of just share in this risk? They share in it. The ones that are involved in global trade, the ones that compete with Citi, for example, like BNP in, in France, uh, they're all heavily involved in the commodities markets. And, you know, reporting in Europe is not anything like in the U.S. Uh, they can hide problems for years, and they will. Uh, you may recall after the 2008 crisis, the European banking uh, community was basically on ice for almost a decade. They ignored loan losses because if they had cleaned up the mess, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had any capital left. Uh, the big problem in Europe is that the banks just don't have the profitability you need to deal with problems. Uh, U.S. banks are very well capitalized. They have excess of liquidity right now. So I'm not particularly worried about them as far as Russia is concerned. But for the rest of the banking world outside of the U.S., I think it's going to be a continuing problem. And it's going to take years to unwind this. So, you know, during that process, as I say, if we have a lot of uh, hyperventilation and headline risk, that's an opportunity to go buy quality names. But I would urge, you know, your viewers to do their homework and be patient. Um, everybody's gotten to the point where we think we have to react instantly. This is one of the, the blessings of social media. And sometimes you want to turn the social media and the TV off and just think about your strategy and take a measured, reasoned approach to getting there. Um, I think oftentimes the best approaches are when you ignore short-term uh, cycles and just stick to your knitting. Like, I'm not selling my NVIDIA, okay? If it goes down another third from where it is now, I'll go buy more. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, people can find you on Twitter at RC Whalen. If people want to find your reports on institutional banks, uh, where can they find that, that analysis? Well, I have the blog, The Institutional Risk Analyst, and we have a premium service, a subscription service, where we actually talk about individual names and markets. I've tried to focus on both the traditional banks and some of the new uh, comers, which are interesting. Uh, there are a whole bunch of banks in the U.S. that got into crypto. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to be able to stay in crypto. That's a sector we didn't talk about much. But the whole impact of the sanctions in Russia and Ukraine is that uh, everybody out there that touches crypto assets is going to have a compliance regime uh, for know your customer and anti-money laundering that looks like a broker dealer. So if you don't have that and you're involved in that industry right now, you better go call your lawyer and start talking to uh, consultants and vendors. Mm. But what about an established broker dealer like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan? If they get involved in crypto, they already are used to that sort of stringent regulation, right? Yes. Um, but, you know, again, the difficulty with crypto is who are you dealing with? Can you actually identify who the counterparty is? Because if you as a U.S. resident innocently do a crypto transaction, and then the folks at FinCEN show up a couple months ago and say, hey, you were trading, uh, trading with a banned party in Russia. Uh, you have problems. You know, you have an obligation to know who you're dealing with. And unfortunately, in the crypto world, you often don't. Now, luckily, Jack, we have the blockchain. And the guys at FinCEN and Treasury have already figured out who to figure out how, or how to figure out who your counterparty is. So we, we can all look forward to that. There we go. Chris, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I've got a few points I want to make, a little bit of a, a few follow-ups. But before you get those, you're going to have to endure a little bit of a plug from me. Please subscribe to the BlockWorks YouTube channel. You can get, you'll, you'll be notified of you know, conversations not just like this, with hosted by me, but also hosted by Alfonso Pecatiello and our two co founders, Mike Ippolito and Jason. So subscribe to the BlockWorks YouTube channel. Uh, click the bell if that's something people do. I, I don't really click the bell. I'm not a bell guy, but you should, you should be a bell person. You should click the bell. Subscribe to the BlockWorks YouTube channel. Click the bell. Also, uh, go to the Apple Podcast app and rate and review uh, the Apple podcast. You know, I'm hoping for the five stars, but if your heart says otherwise, like, you know, it's your life, it's your choice. And I, I get it. But uh, yeah, so leave five stars. And also, if you want to go above and beyond, give the written review um, on the Apple podcast app. Okay, now let's get to what I wanted to talk about. I got like three or four points about the banking system and, and what Chris was saying. The first is that the 
media and just people in general, investors are suffused, they're flooded with the idea that rising rates are good for banks. And, you know, in theory they are because banks make money by extending loans. And when rates are higher, they have a higher rate of return. But it's about not just what they earn on the loans, but the cost of funding as well. And if costs go up and banks suddenly have to pay 3% uh, for overnight deposits, that's going to severely eat into their margins. Uh, and also on the loan point, just you know, sit like uh, the Citibank in Q1 of 2021, first quarter of 2021, they made 5.44% on their loan yield at the time when the five-year treasury was, like, let's say it's 50 basis points roughly. So now, a, a year later, the five-year treasury is at 2.8%. So isn't that great for the banks? Isn't that, oh my God, banks are making so much money? Well, as we said in the interview, Citibank's loan yield was now not 5.44%, but 5.46%, so two basis points increase. Doesn't inspire a lot of confidence there. So that's what Chris was saying. It's about the spread. Um, the other point is about Chris is saying that US banks are not exposed to Russia. Most of the risks there are in European banks. And I don't know enough about that, uh, but I, I do you know, take Chris's word for it about direct exposure. But in terms of commodity exposure, there was a recent uh, 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 paper from the Dallas Fed showing otherwise. And they're unwilling to extend credit to commodity producers because it's so volatile. And of course, Zoltan Poser has been going all about that. What Chris said, what about mortgage-backed securities? Uh, it, it might be confusing to people who are not as familiar with it. The Federal Reserve bought a lot of mortgage-backed securities in March and April of 2020. And they had a coupon of 2%. And they were trading at, let's say, $101. Uh, so the effective yield is maybe 1.8%. I'm just going to make that up. Uh, now, the yield is much, much higher. Mortgage rates are now at, at 5%. So the Federal Reserve now has to sell mortgage-backed securities into the market. I actually, I made a misstatement according to the Federal Reserve 2014 guidelines, but a lot of, a lot of smart people uh, think that the Federal Reserve is going to have to extend mortgages, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. But they, they, you know, mortgage rates are at 5%, and now it's trading at $91. There's not a market for that. It's like, it's like s uh, selling silver coins at a gold fair, you know? And when you're trading size, in large positions, block by block, if other people aren't trading it, then other dealers are going to get it. It's it's sort of a re reflexive loop. Now to the convexity point. Why will the Federal Reserve be forced to sell mortgage-backed securities? Again, this is not an official thing. They have actually said otherwise. But mortgage-backed securities are not convex instruments. They are short convexity. Everyone, you know, A lot of people know what an option is, a call, a put. If you have a mortgage, meaning you have a house and you're on the hook for paying it, have a mortgage, then you kind of have a, a free option because you can refinance if rates go lower. And if rates go increase or stay the same, you don't have to refinance. So people who own a mortgage, investors, not people who have a house, people who own mortgage-backed securities, I should say, uh, they are short convexity. So if interest rates fall, then everyone wants to refinance. And cash flows that they thought they were going to get for 10 years, they now only get for three years. If interest rates rise, then uh, it's the opposite. And cash flows they thought they were going to have for 10 years are now going to be 20 years. So interest rates have risen a huge amount. And that is why Chris is saying, and Joseph Wang has made points about this too, that no one is going to refinance their mortgage. Everyone who's got, who wants to buy a home, a lot of people, they, they have a home. And if they were going to, if they're going to buy a home, they're going to do it when mortgage rates are at two, not when they're at 5% or 6% as Chris think, thinks they're going to go. So if no one is refinancing their, their mortgage, uh, then mortgage-backed securities will not prepay, and they will. The duration of them is extended uh, for a very long time. I, 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 I knew this from Joseph, and I thought they were like six, seven years. But Chris was saying ten, twelve, maybe fifteen years. I don't know if he said fifteen. Uh, so that means that the Federal Reserve's plan of letting the mortgage-backed security roll off, they're going to be waiting for twelve years. It's it's going to be. 2034, when the, that mortgage-backed security rolls off. The duration changes. It's not like a, a treasury bond when it's, uh, you know, it's seven years and it, it pays off in seven years. They are extremely, uh, they have a huge amount of volatility in the duration. 
So they would have to sell into an open market, and and uh, that would be a, a lot of a lot of problems. Uh, so, and this is and this goes on with the treasuries too. I was just looking into you know, the Federal Reserve was buying billions and billions of dollars of treasuries every day in March and April when the thirty-year bond was at one point two percent, and TLT was at one hundred seventy. Not that they trade TLT, obviously. What they what they bought in a day was greater than the entire market cap of TLT. But I'm just saying that as an example. So if if the Fed is facing a 30% mark to market loss, that is a problem. And I actually brought up what Chris said about the Federal Reserve going insolvent with Joseph. And I haven't discussed it extensively, but Joseph sent me a link to the Federal Reserve's website. And there are a lot of reasons why this shouldn't happen, such as the fact that according to the Federal Reserve's official policy, they don't sell assets. They let them roll over, except you know, it, except really when they just want to sort of test test things. And also, their liabilities, bank reserves, don't yield any interest, uh, although I guess they do during d the reverse repo rate. Um, but yeah, but you know, very close to zero interest rates. And they own treasury. So if you own a treasury at it's yielding 2% and the reverse repo rate is zero, it's kind of hard to lose money. And yet, the Fed might find a way if it has to sell these mortgage-backed securities and perhaps treasuries at a huge mark-to-market loss. So I just wanted to share a few thoughts uh, with with you guys there. I don't know if I made things any clearer, uh, you know, because I brought up a few extra issues. But hopefully, I broke down a few of those important concepts that you know I know if if I was new to sort of finance and new to listening to podcasts, they definitely would confuse me. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, and please do not forget to. Let's see, subscribe to the YouTube channel and leave a review on the Apple Podcast app and perhaps even a written review. All right, thanks so much. Talk soon.